Excellent. All right, so we ended up um, leaving off at MO theory, um, talking about the diagrams, the difference between the um, general chemistry diagrams and the inorganic diagrams, the meaning of Gerard and un-Gerard as it relates to um, orbitals, even in odd. Um, so this is a general chemistry um, picture where they have the um, B2, C2, N2, O2, and F2. Um, as a reminder, the order of these MOs, and this is just the center, it's not showing the full scheme. Um, when I say the full scheme, I mean where we draw both the atomic orbitals that are contributing to it and the center. Uh, so this is where that, that blue strip is right there. That's what they're drawing, okay? So from the general chemistry um, textbook, you can see the um, notations of sigma 2s. Uh, they don't include the 1s because this is valence. Uh, so sigma 2s, sigma 2s star, that's the bonding and antibonding set that's formed from the 2s orbital. And then you see that there is the pi 2p and the sigma 2p for B2, C2, and N2, but that these are reversed for O2 and F2. So we're going to talk about that reversal uh, again. I started to talk about it. Um, but I wanted to point out that you should be able to fill these diagrams. You did not have to do that for the exam. Um, so if you have your periodic table with you, um, boron is in group three. So it has three valence electrons, just like you would for um, when you're doing Lewis dot structures. So since there's two of them, um, you have the total of six electrons that you would have to fill up. And they follow the same rules uh, as the electron configuration. You just have the spin up and then a spin down, and then you go up, spin up, spin down. And then for a degenerate set, you go spin up first and then you pair. So Hun's rule, all those other rules are followed. Um, so C2 would have two more electrons because each carbon is one more electron. So four and four is eight. Um, nitrogen is five and five, so that's 10 total electrons. Um, O2 is 12. So you're increasing by two each time because you're adding two elements and each of those has one more electron. The idea of bond order is supportive of the Lewis dot structures. <clears throat> so the bond order is simply the number of bonds between the two atoms. So if you were to do the Lewis dot structure for B2, it would have a single bond. C2 would have a double bond. Uh, nitrogen would have a triple bond. O2 would have a double bond and F2 would have a single bond, okay? The bond order has an equation. Um, so I'm gonna put my dot cam on here. So in regards to the um, <clears throat> diagram, bond order is equal to one half times the bonding electrons minus the antibonding electrons, Abe's, okay? So that's just a little equation that should be supportive of the observation for Lewis dots. Okay, so if we were just looking at boron, you see that boron has two electrons. Well, let's just write this out. Sigma 2s2 and the sigma star. Now this is the organic um, notation sigma star 2s2 and then pi 2p2. The corresponding inorganic notation would be one sigma g2, one sigma u2, and pi u2. So this would be the way that an inorganic chemist would write it. So if we're going to get the bond order, we see that this is the antibonding and these are bonding 
Yes, Amaya. Sorry. Um, so like, uh, hold on, I lost your picture. But the bonding that you're drawing, is this, this is based off the MO theory, right? Because the, mm -hmm. the U yeah, and G. We're on, yeah, we're on the MO theory. Okay. And um, the diagram that's on the PowerPoint that's showing is the MO diagrams for B2, C2, N2, O2, and F2. The picture on the screen is from a Gen Chem book. I'm gonna pull up the organic book, inorganic book in a minute. And so we're talking about bond order, which is just the number of bonds. Um, so this is a little trick that you can use with the, um, <clears throat> the diagram. So the diagram is predictive of a lot of behaviors, including bond order. You would get the same bond order from Lewis dot structure, but we want you to be able to do this as well. So given the equation requires, you know, the bonding electrons and the anti-bonding electrons, we're just identifying the ones in the middle here in my picture on the PowerPoint, where my face is, or was it, where my face was, um, we have a total of bonding electrons. We've got four, right? Two in the sigma G and two in the pi U. Um, I'm sorry, that should be one pi U. So we have four, and then we only have two in the um, anti-bonding orbitals. And so one half of four minus two equals one. So the bond order of, uh, it's diboron, not just boron, diboron, B2, is <clears throat> one. Okay, so we'll do nitrogen next. Um, we don't do all of them, I'll just do nitrogen. So N2, we don't usually say dinitrogen, we assume it's N2, but we can say dinitrogen just so everybody's clear that it's the diatomic. So if I'm just looking at the picture, and I'm just gonna go ahead and do the inorganic notation by looking at the picture, I can do that. So we have the one sigma G, which corresponds to the sigma 2S, and there's two there. And then we have the one sigma U, which corresponds to the sigma 2S star, um, and that's going to be two. And then we have the <clears throat> one pi, and that's U, and that corresponds to um, the pi 2P, the bonding. Um, so in N2, there's four there. And then the next one is the second set of sigmas, so it's called two sigma G, and that has two in it. So we have the bonding you still have your hand up, Amaya. I don't know if that's from before or that's new. Okay, so the, sorry, I was talking and writing at the same time. So we have the bonding, which is the G here, the anti-bonding, which is the U sigma, the bonding, which is the pi U. So U doesn't correspond to bonding or anti-bonding, it corresponds to even or odd with respect to rotation. Um, so I can show you those pictures again if you need me to. <clears throat> and then the last one is bonding. So we have a total of electrons, two here, four here, and two here. So it's a total of eight bonding electrons minus the anti-bonding electrons, which is this one right here. And that is one half of that. And so the bond order is equal to one half of six, which is three. So that's a triple bond. All right, we'll take a pause here. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I understand like the the sig like the the G and U part, and I just can't remember like how are you looking at the electrons? Is it based off these lines? Yeah, the electrons are um, the little arrows. Okay. And the um, where the line is located, it's lining up here. See, this is yeah. the first one. I'm reading lower energy to higher energy, just like I would if I were doing an electron configuration. So if I was doing 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, same kind of thing. I'm filling up these orbitals and I'm representing them in this configuration. Okay. okay so this picture here is from general chemistry, and I brought this up because of the, um, 
the summary down here, which is really nice. Okay, but I don't like the fact that we have to get mixed up with these labels. So we'll go back over the labels again, if you like. But um, let me just finish up with this, um, this table. So I wanted to talk about the bond order. Um, we also want to talk about magnetism. Um, so as you recall, paramagnetic and diamagnetic are the terms we refer to when we talk about magnetism. So paramagnetic is having unpaired electrons. and diamagnetic like dice is everything is paired. Okay, so if I were to draw the Lewis dot structure of O2 and you just looked at that molecule, you would not understand that that is actually going to be looking at the diagram. You have unpaired electrons, right? So that's going to be paramagnetic and we can measure that. So if you didn't have this theory, you would just assume that it was diamagnetic because you look at the Lewis dot structure, you say, well, isn't everything paired up? But in actuality, you can measure this. You can measure that the oxygen gas will move in an electric field. The reason is um, because of these antibonding orbital electrons in the pi. Okay, so having those in this theory explains this paramagnetic property of oxygen. Now, as far as um, bond length and bond strength, um, <clears throat> a triple bond is the strongest and shortest. Can't spell strongest and shortest. And a double uh, single bond is weakest and longest. So the more bonds you have, the tight, tighter they're held to the two atoms. So you don't have to know these numbers, but those are the actual numbers of the observed bond energies and the bond lengths that can be measured. So that's the information I wanted to share about this diagram. And I'm gonna review a couple topics um, <clears throat> that you might not have gotten the first time. So we'll go back a little bit. There's any questions on this before I go back a little bit? I just have one quick question to make mm -hmm. sure I'm understanding it. So when you were doing the bond order equation, mm -hmm. isn't, the Gerard and Ungerard for the pi bonds, well, for the, yeah, for the pi one, aren't they switched? Is that why Ungerard for pi is considered a bonding and not? They are switched, but that's not why. We're going to review that. Okay. Yeah. So they mean even and odd with respect to rotation. Um, so um, yes, they are switched. So visually, we'll go back. Okay. So this is a pi, um, this is a pi orbital. I'm gonna draw it on the paper as well. Um, let me draw the sigma on the paper first. So when two orbitals are made, whether that sigma is, um, we'll do an S and an S, in order to have constructive interference, they have to have the same sign, okay? so. Let me make this closer. The lighting's kind of weird, so. Ah, uh, that didn't help. I don't know if that helped. Anyway, so these are two, remember the bonding is a constructive interference. We're adding two wave functions, okay? They have to be the same sign. Typically what we do is we just shade them for plus and leave them white for minus. So when there's, the same sign when you add them you get constructive interference okay so this is one big there's the two uh, nuclei that are made in the mo theory as the bonding okay so that's bonding and if i were to put an axis here and rotate it the sign would not change 
right? The whole thing's one big plus, okay? So no sign change. That means even, which is a G, okay? Gerar means even in German, okay? Whereas if I'm making the wave function, which is destructive, I have opposite signs or I'm adding a negative, whatever. It's two opposite sign S orbitals. Could be P as well. And then I'm going to get the antibonding. And when I get the antibonding, here's one nuclei, here's the other nuclei. But this is dark and this is light. So if I add an axis and I rotate them, the dark goes on the other side and the white goes on the other side. They switch, that's uneven, so that's a U, okay? And I can do the exact same thing if I have a sigma that's formed from two P orbitals. So if I have two P orbitals that make a sigma bond, then they would have to have constructive interference. The two dark lobes would have to be facing each other to make my Tootsie Roll. It's my Tootsie Roll. In my Tootsie Roll, the inside would be the dark and this would be light and light, okay? And so if I rotate that, then it's not gonna change the sign. So that's still gonna be a G. And these are both sigmas. This is a sigma type and this is a sigma type. This is just happens to be made from S orbital. This is a sigma that's made from a P orbital, okay? Um, that's a sigma bonding and it's the first one. So it's called one sigma G. This is called one sigma U. This is called two sigma G. The antibonding P interaction would be if they're adding a negative, just like before. So instead of having the two positive lobes or the two negative lobes interacting constructively, we would have the opposite signs. And that gives us adding a negative, adding the, adding the negative lobe to the positive lobe. And that gives us this anti-Tootsie roll. Sorry, this is the only way I know how to say it. Okay, where you have this uh, alternating sign. And then when you rotate these, that changes sign, so that's called a U. So that's the two sigma U. This is anti, this is anti up here. This is bonding, this is bonding. And Dr. Taylor, it's the second, it's, it's two sigma G because it's the second time you have a sigma mm -hmm. in this. Yeah, they okay. paired together. So they're both twos, the antibonding and the bonding pair coming from the same type of inner interference time type of um, orbitals. Yep. Okay, so the pi bond is a sideways overlap. I would say when you have constructive interference with a pi scenario, you've got this sideways overlap where the positives enhanced and the negative is enhanced. And that looks like a hot dog bun. And you have the dark on the top, which is constructive interference of these two lobes. And then you have the light on the bottom, positive or negative. Um, that's a bonding pi. So with a bonding pi, when you rotate it, it actually does change sign. So according to um, the <clears throat> Gerard and Ungerard, Ungerard, that is a U. So that would be a one pi U. And there would be a similar one that's pointed out of the paper. Because there, remember there's three P orbitals. So this would be, for example, P, PZ, this would be PY, and there would also be a PX. Um, so I'm not showing that, it was just too hard to draw. Um, Dr. Taylor, mm -hmm. 
I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm just clarifying this, but the constructive interferences is when the electrons are next to each other. The, no. I mean, the positive sign. Yeah, the constructive interference is it has the same sign. So if I were to draw, um, just to off, off the side here, if I were to draw a wave, this is the positive amplitude and this is the negative amplitude, right? Positive amplitude, negative amplitude. It's an actual wave. Wave function is a wave. Okay, if I put another wave over top of it, then they're additive and the wave gets bigger. Okay, they add together, like when you're at the beach and two waves get together and they make a bigger wave. But if I have a, a wave like this, and then I have a wave that is exactly opposite, right? What happens? That cancels and that cancels. Constructive, destructive. So going back to, let's look back at the pictures for the, um, here. All right, so my cartoons are a little bit different than the book cartoons, but let's look at their cartoons now. Okay, so figure structure 2-23. This is a G, you see their arrow? You see the constructive interference positive with a positive. You rotate it, it stays positive, it's a G. This is the antibonding sigma. You have destructive interference because you have a positive and a negative. Why they put them together, I have no idea. I didn't make the cartoons. Because technically there'd be nothing in the middle. Um, but you put that line, that arrow, the axis there, and you rotate it, it changes sign, so that's a U. Okay, so that's figure 2-24. Um, so this is the general chemistry figure that describes the, um, the bonding for the P's. Um, the issue with that is they don't show the negative and positive lobes. Um, but the um, drawings are accurate. They don't show the negative and positive lobes, okay? So the pies that show the negative and positive lobes from your textbook, figure 2-25, that's a bonding pie. So it's got that, you know, constructive on the bottom, constructive on the top, right? You rotate it, it's a U. Okay, so that correlates to my picture that looks like a hamburger or a hot dog bun. Okay, and this is the antibonding. I didn't draw that, but that's the antibonding equivalent. So that is the alternating sign. And when you rotate it, the positive replaces the positive and the negative replaces the negative. So it ends up being even, G. Okay, so the answer to the question, Aaliyah, exactly, they switch. <laughs> but you still need to know why. Okay, you still need to know why they switch. Okay. So that's the, the theory that creates the, um, the diagram. So we're going to look back at the diagrams because sometimes you just don't get it till the second time around. I don't need the, the PowerPoint, so let me, I mean, all right. So we don't need the drawing right now. Okay, so on the left-hand side of this, and you can see here it says boron through nitrogen. And I've already given you the summary slide. So let's just go back over the, you know, the individual drawings. Okay, so the MO is in the middle. The atomic orbitals are drawn on the left and the right. And this entire diagram is not necessarily needed most of the time, okay? So the right-hand side is the diagram from your inorganic textbook. It has the G's and the U's and the numbering and all of that. These red lines get a little bit confusing. They're actually easier to see in this next diagram, if I can get my PowerPoint to move, because they're not um, as complicated. So this is the diagram uh, from your inorganic textbook on the right and general chem on the left for um, oxygen and fluorine. 
remember the order is switched. So these red lines are indicating mixing. Okay, so if I have an S orbital here and an S orbital here, this is saying they're mixing. Okay, the red line going down, this is mixing constructively to create the G. And this red up here is saying it's mixing destructively to create this one. Okay, and then the P's, you see they're interfering constructively here, one of the P's. So we call that the PZ to make a sigma. And then the other two that are left, the P, um, X and PY create the degenerate set of pi's. And then they have their antibonding equivalents. So the red line is indicating the mixing. Okay, so you notice the one I had up here earlier. You see this here? The problem with the boron and nitrogen is these are actually closer in energy together, the S and the P. They aren't as separated. And as a result, they actually have some mixing, which results in this reversal of this sigma. So the pi is actually lower in energy than the sigma, whereas here it's switched. Okay, so now we're going to look at the composite diagram from your um, inorganic textbook. So this is a similar diagram to this one here, but this is from your inorganic textbook. And you can see the relative energies are different. Um, so your general chemistry textbook, they don't show you that. They show everything having the same equal energy, but that's not the case. Okay, so um, there is mixing that causes the pi u to be um, a little bit higher in energy and the pi g to be um, a lot higher in energy. Okay, so from this mixing. So that's why the order is line, line, double line, line, double line, line. That's how I call it. All the way up to oxygen and see here with nitrogen, they're very, very close. Um, and then with oxygen, they completely switch places in terms of energy. So you see this blue line or purple line is dropping in energy. Okay. This makes a lot more sense now because I thought those lines were, I didn't know they were representing the energy levels of each bond. Yeah. Yeah. So on this energy scale. So we did the same orbital diagrams for atoms as well with, in terms of energy. So you have to make that connection between the two. All right, so I'm gonna switch to um, the hand-drawn thing. All right, so you should be able to, at this point, you're going to be having questions on your next exam that will require that you be able to draw these. It's good to just know them and have, not have to go look them up. It's not that difficult. On the ACS exam, you have to know this order. Um, otherwise, you, you, know, you can't memorize all of the trends and everything unless you know the diagram. So line, line, double line, line, double line, 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 double line, line, double line, line. That's for the um, boron through nitrogen. And then the other two, O2 and F2, line, line, and then line. And then these are stacked and then here. And the single lines are always sigma. So you can always label them sigma, the single lines. The double lines are always pi's. Right? And then um, the bondings for the sigmas are G's in a pair. The antibondings are U's. And it's switched for the pi's. Right? So pattern, pattern learning. Um, and then just the numbering, the first sigmas, the first sigma pair, the second sigma pair, and the first pi pair.
All right, so I want you to go ahead and um, look at the second drawing. I want you to draw um, or sketch out O2 and O2, two minus. So O2 is dioxygen, O2, two minus is peroxide. Let's compare those two together. You don't have to label everything, you just sketch it out, you know. You gotta fill them out with electrons. Can you scroll back up a little bit, if you don't mind? I drew them here. You see them? I need the, um, the, 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 the ones. The what? Twos and the ones that oh you don't, you don't need to label them you just need to put electrons in them all of that's in, on the powerpoint you see the powerpoint kyra it's on the powerpoint there's a bug on here So really the only question is, how many electrons does O2 have in the valence shell? And then how many does O2 two minus have? Hey, Brandon, how many valence electrons does O2 have? Total. 12. Correct. Yeah. And how many would um, this one have? It's two minus. Um, 14. Correct. y'all get this? So if you're looking at the PowerPoint, O2 is already up there. Um, this is my version of that diagram. Um, and O2, two minus is identical to F2 because it's isoelectronic, having the same number of electrons. So looking at this, what's the difference? What, what would be different about these two uh, molecules? Um, would the, the O2 be, um, paramagnetic mm -hmm. and the other one would be, um, diamagnetic. Mm -hmm. Um, how about the bond order? I'll let you cheat. Look at the, um, PowerPoint. So O2 is a bond odor of what? Why is um, O2 not paramagnetic? Or did I mishear that? We said O2 is paramagnetic and O2, two minus, is diamagnetic. Okay. Because if you're looking um, at the apologies. diagram, these are all paired and this is, those two are unpaired. So if you're looking at bond order, what's the bond order of O2? Anybody else paying attention? O2 is two for bond order. Correct. And if O2 minus is isoelectronic with F2, what's its bond order? One. Correct. So O2, first of all, is more stable. It's got a double bond. It's more stable because a double bond is stronger and shorter, holds it together more, greater bond energy. It's paramagnetic, whereas uh, peroxide is diamagnetic, less stable. 
because it has a single bond. Okay. I just had a revelation. Okay. I got all it. of that. Yeah. I just okay. Okay. So um the we spent a lot of time on this. Um let's you know just leave it there and um look at some hetero um molecules. So you can draw this diagram for groups of molecules as well as diatomics, but we're going to stick to diatomics for now. Later on, we're going to talk about the um, hetero, I mean the um, multi-atom um, molecules. But for now, you can draw the diagram for more than just um, the homo uh, diatomics. So two oxygens, two nitrogens, two borons, et cetera. How about HCl, for example? That makes a molecular bond in the gas phase. Uh, you could draw a diagram for that. So if you remember the wave function that we represents these orbitals, the wave function is phi A plus phi B for the constructive, and then phi A plus the opposite sign, phi B for the destructive. Um, and so you see how this has the two dark lobes together and then the light and the dark together. So constructive is bonding, destructive is anti-bonding. Um, so this can happen with um, hetero atoms and you see that they're not at the same energy level. So the mixing's not as strong. Um, for example, you see down here, um, the mixing is um, this, phi A, which is the wave function of the anion. Um, the B is the hydrogen. So this is closer to the bonding orbital. And so if you've got a polar atom that actually makes really a lot of sense, um, most of the electron density is associated with the more electronegative atom. So with an acid, the hydrogen atom is going to um, not really have a lot of electron density on it. So it's going to contribute more closely to this other orbital. It's closer. So the C in this equation is actually a weighting factor. So we say that the bonding orbital is more heavily weighted towards the anion and the antibonding orbital is actually more heavily weighted uh, to the cation meaning that most of the electron density is going to be on the anion part. So you can draw this diagram for any um, diatomic, even if they're not the same. Oops, sorry. So this is the um, HF diagram. Um, so you can see this antibonding is mainly the hydrogen, um, and the bonding orbitals are mainly associated with the um, fluorine atom, which is electronegative. So this is um, a lot more complex in terms of how they're mixing and it doesn't go in a particular order. Um, so I'm not asking you to memorize how or to be able to explain how this is put together, but you can read a diagram. So it's got one S orbital and the S orbital is mixing with the S orbital of the hydrogen to make the bonding and the antibonding, um, but they're not identical. So they're not labeled one and one anymore. That's why that numbering is weird because they're not identical anymore. They're not mirror images. Um, and then the antibonding occurs with the S of the um, fluorine and the one S of the hydrogen. You can see that right there. So there's really two um, mixing schemes right here from the S. And then the P that has the three lines, um, it has two here and then one there. Anyway. Um, I didn't want to get into any more detail other than the fact that you can see that the antibonding is mostly associated with the hydrogen and the bonding's orbitals are mostly associated with the one that has the electron density in it. Um, so this is carbon monoxide. You know, there's, there's many you can draw. All right, so that's enough of the molecules. Um, the next topic is going to be solids. So that's where we're headed into. I know y'all love solids. It's a preference. Okay, so we'll start out easy and then we'll, um, this is really very descriptive right now. 
um, and then we'll get into unit cells and all of that stuff. Uh, so on Wednesday next week, I expect you to be thoroughly prepared with a general chemistry review before Wednesday. Um, as you guys know, that solid state is um, highly ordered. It's in a well-defined shape. It's nearly incompressible. Um, things are in fixed position. So we've talked about uh, molecules, um, but the solid state is something that we really um, we need to focus on. Most of the solid states we're going to be talking about um, can be classified in two major categories, uh, crystalline or amorphous. The word crystalline de is describing a regular consistent pattern throughout, whereas amorphous is not. Okay, so the um, regular array or well-defined order can be obtained through the crystallizations of things like sodium chloride and sugar. So the shine, the shininess you see on crystals indicates that they have this ordered array, otherwise they wouldn't reflect the light. So when you see crystalline, it is crystals. It's like organic when you crystallize your product, remember? If you all were lucky enough to get in the organic lab before COVID. Um, amorphous is disordered. Um, if you were an organic and your crude product is typically this powdery product, remember that? The goo, um, that's not crystalline, um, that's amorphous. Um, and it doesn't have that shine to it because it came out too quick and it didn't have time to form those really well-defined uh, shapes that, that cause it to be um, crystalline. Okay. Um, glass that you have in the window pane is actually amorphous, um, but you can have something um, quartz that is crystalline. So quartz glass is the same formula as the glass that's in the window pane. One is formed over time um, carefully, which is the quartz, and it makes these really beautiful crystals, whereas glass is just sand that's heated up to like a thousand degrees and makes a goo. Okay, so you can have different forms of the same solid. Those are called allotropes, remember that? Here's some pictures of um, some beautiful crystals. We have the fool's gold on the left, pyrite, and amethyst on the right. So you can have a true appreciation for the beauty of crystals. My husband's home, so he's gonna be walking past and back. Okay, and making all kinds of noise. All right, so we're gonna be focusing most of our energy on the crystalline state uh, because the crystalline state we can describe in a systematic way because it is crystalline. Um, I will just mention that amorphous solids are actually really important. So a lot of our polymers that are made, let's just mention, since my husband walked past um, at DuPont, they make all kinds of those things and they make a lot of money on them. Uh, most of them are based upon nylon, 6-6 nylon, which makes Kevlar, Nomex, Mylar, all those polymers, those are amorphous. They can't control the synthesis very well, um, so they've got these defects, so they're never perfect, but they do have um, some interesting properties. So there's some importance to that, um, but we're gonna focus mostly on crystalline solids. Okay, so our crystalline um, solids are going to have this well-defined, what we call a lattice. So that's the continuous structure. The lattice is the continuous structure, the global structure of it. Like if you're standing way back from it and looking at it, you say, this is the global structure. Um, but from the point of view of a, you know, someone looking through a microscope or um, someone studying a crystal, the smallest representative unit of that repeating pattern is referred to as the unit cell. 
And in inorganic chemistry, um, and this kind of leads into the lab um, topic, um, one of the spectroscopy topics is X-ray crystallography. Okay, so X-ray crystallography can be um, used on um, amorphous solids, um, but there needs to be some crystallinity on the surface. Um, typically, X-ray crystallography works best if you have a crystal of your substance that you can analyze. This is just a picture of a one-dimensional picture of what a unit cell is. A unit cell can be different uh, shapes. It doesn't have to be a cube. Um, and so here you can see we could draw different unit cells for this repeating pattern. Um, so the one on the left would, if you repeated, would re represent this whole thing. So would the one in the middle and so would the one on the right, which is a parallelogram. So it doesn't have to be a cube. Okay. So the uh, 3D arrangement um, in space, we refer to different lattice points of the crystal. And again, the lattice points um, are defining our unit cell. And this is, again, the smallest representative structure. To analyze um, our crystals, we use uh, crystallography, as I mentioned. Crystallography uses the idea that if you have a regular repeating unit, you have these clearly defined um, planes um, based on the density of the atoms that are in the structure. And when you put x-rays through your sample, um, if you have this repeating pattern, what it's doing is uh, reflecting and constructively interfering with a bunch of these rays coming off. And so you can infer a pattern and then figure out the structure. This is what they used to do in the old days. They would get this photographic plate and from all of these dots, they could figure out what the structure was. So someone would spend their entire PhD thesis on just this one structure. Um, but this is the um, diffractometer, um, typical diffractometer that we use um, if you've watched my lecture, you would know that um, I, I did work with um, X-ray crystallography in my um, PhD. I did not solve my structures. People typically will specialize in this and they do this at, as their entire research. Um, and so a lot of times people will collaborate and send them samples, just like people who analyze DNA, that's all they do when you send DNA to them. Um, so this is similar. Um, so this is um, the, the machine has this protective, um, uh, what do you call it, hood, and then you have this siren light. Um, it is x-ray, so you have to be uh, very careful with it. And your sample, it's got like a pin that you put your sample on, and then it does all these crazy angles to try to get different um, patterns off of your sample. Um, and then the computer will interpret those. I don't know if you can see that tiny little pin right there where my mouse is, that's where the sample goes. They actually put some cool gas on it to keep it from vibrating too much so that it gets a nice clean pattern. Um, this is an example of the output of, um, this is my compound and uh, Dr. Laura Pence um, end up, ended up marrying my boss. Um, She's um, still University of Hartford. She's heavily involved in ACS. Oops, sorry. Um, so this is the crystal structure of one of my compounds that I made. It's a really simple one. It's not that exciting. Um, it is published, but it's in the supplementary materials because no one cares about a simple structure like this anymore. It used to be in the old days, this was exciting. Um, but in nowadays, it has to be super interesting looking or do some kind of job for anyone to really care about the crystal structure. So this is really more of a confirmation of I made what I thought I made and then she solved the structure. I made the crystals. I sent her the crystals and she analyzed them with her uh, diffractometer um, at University of Hartford. And you can see these are all carbons, the C's, and they number them. Um, so this is a, a ligand, what we call a ligand. Um, it's attached to a cobalt and then it's got two uh, bromines attached to the cobalt. Um, this whole structure has a name. It's called an ORTEP diagram. Um, and so that comes from where it was discovered, Oak Ridge, which is a national lab, thermal ellipsoid plot. 
The ellipsoids are these little things. And they're just giving you um, the region and space that that atom would be found in. Um, and when you get the output, they give you the angles between the atoms. They give you a whole list of angles. Um, they give you bond lengths. They give you the error involved. So they plus or minus so many angstroms. So you can get a really good picture of this. Um, the Biotech One research facility in, um, associated with MCB campus, they actually have people who specialize in this with um, enzymes because that's the frontier in crystallography is crystallizing enzymes because they're particularly testy because they're huge. They're kilodaltons, as you all know, hopefully. Um, so doing this crystal structure for an enzyme even if it's not in water, because having an enzyme hydrated sometimes gives it a different structure. Um, you know in biochemistry that structure and functional relationship is very important. So um, there's been a lot of research in this. Um, one of my mentors who is no longer with us, uh, Dr. Fenn, won the Nobel Prize for coming up with um, something called electrospray which allows for the analysis of, of enzymes. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, the Nobel Prize in associated with determining the structure of an enzyme. That, that tells you how important that is in the revolution of our understanding of biochemistry. So there is a relationship between inorganic and biochemistry. It's actually called bioinorganic. Um, and that was where my interest was when I was an undergrad. So I had um, actually gone to MCV and I was accepted to the PH program for biochemistry. And I used to teach it. Um, and I've taught the MCAT course um, at um, University of Richmond and um, taught the biochemistry course at VSU for a while. But anyway, my interest was understanding the structural functional relationships and the role of inorganic ions in enzymes. Okay, so X-ray crystallography has a really important impact in um, both inorganic and bioinorganic. So the basic um, shapes that you can have for your unit cells um, actually range quite a bit. I'm just gonna show you the picture and we'll end here. Um, we're gonna spend a lot of time reviewing um, the cubic unit cells, okay? And all of everything that goes with the cubic unit cell. We can't study them all, um, but these are the basic um, structures that can form. So cubic, tetragonal, or thrombic, monoclinic, triclinic, trigonal, and hexagonal. So these are the, the seven crystal classes. That's what they're called, the seven crystal classes. So when you form crystals, and your crystals are representative of the overall lattice, these are the seven basic ones that will form. So you need to be able to um, match them, characterize them based upon the length, so this is clearly a cube. This is not a cube. It's a rectangle. That means it has one side longer, right? So this says AAA, this has AAC, meaning these two sides are the same, that side's longer. And then there's the rectangle that has the um, three sides different, um, but all of these would have 90 degree angles. They're square corners. And the ones underneath of it they don't have 90 degree angles, they have different angles. Okay, so the triclinic has three different angles, that's why it's called triclinic. The monoclinic has the one angle defined at the bottom, and trigonal has three the same angles but not 90 degrees. The trigonal has the size all the same, so it's a cube on its skewed. The monoclinic does not have the sides all the same. So there are patterns to this and the patterns are in the table right here where it says not equal to or equal to. That's the summary of the different um, relationships in these different names. So that's where we're gonna end um, the things we're going to talk about Wednesday are heavily weighted on general chemistry. Um, so simple cubic, body-centered, face-centered, all that stuff with some additional computations. Um, so make sure before Wednesday you review that. And um, 
I will see you guys at um, 3.30 for lab, um, where we're gonna review for your um, open book test, which is gonna be held during inorganic class on Monday. And I hope to see you all at the ACS uh, meeting tonight. Um, the teacher of the year for um, the United States who got to meet, well, it's kind of funny, he got to go to the White House. He wasn't really that excited about meeting Donald Trump, um, but he has recorded, he's a VSU grad. Um, so he is, um, he's recorded a message which we're gonna play at the beginning of the, um, the event and we're honoring, as you know, for those of you who have recorded something, we're honoring the teachers in Virginia. So teachers awards um, we've had at VSU before. Um, we've hosted the ACS meeting a few times. Um, but it's, it's an honor to host the meeting and it, I'll be the really the person behind the curtain uh, keeping everything going. I'm only going to speak once and then I'm going to hand over the hosting to um, Dr. Lachelle Waller, who is a really good person to know. Um, she's a great mentor. Um, Lachelle Waller is at VCU and she's the head of the undergraduate research course for their undergrads, um, as well as the advisors for all the um, the advising coordinator for all of the um, chemistry majors. Um, Dr. Sammy L. Shal is the chair of chemistry for VCU. He's the current ACS chair for our Virginia section. So hopefully you can make it. Um, they are um, always interested in having students do research. I don't know what that's going to look like this coming summer, but I would imagine that they're going to get creative with the NSF funding that they have for their RU program. So certainly um, making yourself known and um, is always important. So thank you. And I will see you all, uh, some of you all at 3.30 and the rest of you all see you at six-ish, 6.30. Bye.